is from Shriners Hospitals for Children, and she's going to be talking about the burning need to know, managing burns of all depths and sizes. She is a fantastic speaker, and we are thrilled to have her. Thank you for everyone in the audience for making the effort to come down. We really appreciate that, and the speakers always do too. So with that, my little reminder for those of you on Teams, when you join us, please mute yourself. Don't hit mute all because then you mute the speaker. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Madsen, who is going to introduce our speaker. And so for now, just sit back and relax and enjoy the show. All right. Hello, friends, and welcome back to Grand Rounds. I was tempted to do this in like a spooky Halloween voice, but I'll wait until we're a little closer to the holiday. I'm exercising some self-restraint. Just a couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, at the very end of the presentation, when we th do the Q&A section, I'm basically going to run a microphone to whoever has a question in the audience. So raise your hands. I'll keep tab on who's next and so forth. That way the speaker doesn't have to repeat the question because sometimes those questions come with a bit of backstory before the question. And that way everyone that's online can hear the questions in their full intended form. All right, today's topic is a hot one, pun intended. Debbie Harrell has worked in burn care for nearly 40 years. She was director of Cincinnati Shriners Hospital Burn Unit, has worked in burn care research and developed teaching tools about lighter safety burn prevention, and burn care. Debbie is currently the Director of Professional Relations at Shriners Children's Ohio and speaks on the state, regional, national, and international level, educating all levels of healthcare providers on burn management. Give a warm welcome to Debbie Harrell. Awesome, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Uh, so. Uh, I see some familiar faces. So some of you may have already heard this information. Um, so hopefully maybe you'll get something new out of it. But uh, I think it's a great, great recap for people. So just a little bit about Shriners Hospital and the system. So Shriners Hospital is a system of uh, about 22 facilities. We are better known for orthopedic care just simply because there are more orthopedic hospitals. The closest orthopedic hospital for the Dayton area would be the Lexington, Kentucky. Um, the Ohio Hospital were a pediatric burn unit and a pediatric plastic specialty unit. All Shriners hospitals take kids up to the age of 18, regardless of patient and family ability to pay. One of the big benefits of our system is we provide all transportation to and from our hospital for as long as our kids are in our system. The dark blue that you see up there, that's going to be what we consider our catchment area. Uh, so far this year, we've received kids from about 23 states and i think we're up to about 14 different countries the way we are able to do that is we are funded by donation so that's just kind of how shriners hospitals work all of us within the system we are a referral facility so we do depend on you guys to refer your burn patients to us um, that's how our hospital actually works we do not have an emergency department again we depend on yours so what I'm going to talk to you about today is just stabilization of a large burn. As I said, many of you um, have heard this information before, but I'm just going to start with a few statistics. So the biggest thing about burns, uh, statistically nationally, large burns are way, way down. As you can see, almost 75% of or 70% uh, of burns are under 10%, almost. 90% um, of burns are actually under 20%. We are truly in the small burn business. The biggest driver for that, smoke detectors. If you have a working smoke detector, it's an 80% reduction in mortality, 75% reduction in injury, just if you have a working smoke detector. The thing that you'll hear about a house fire when you do hear about deaths, it's typically the elderly or the very young. And the reason for the elderly is obviously they can't get out. Honestly, the reason for the young is we do not take escape plans very seriously. And when your smoke detector goes off in the middle of the night, your child panics and either hides or runs to your room. So if you have children or interact or they ever stay at your house, you should have an escape plan for how they get out. Um, so we're going to start at initial triage. So this is actually at scene. So this is kind of high level. Um, so the reason I started seeing hypo, uh, hypothermia is one of the major complications for a burn patient from scene 
to actually the emergency department. So when you're talking about your large burns, so one of the functions of your skin, as we well know, is thermoregulation. It controls your temperature. If you burn all of your skin off, you cannot control your temperature. If you're in a house fire and you're an 80% burn and you're laying on the lawn and it's 70 degrees, your body will attempt to go down to ambient air. So what our number one goal and role is to keep a burn patient warm and dry. There's nothing sterile about it on the front end of this. So it doesn't matter what shoes in the field or honestly in the emergency department, blankets, sheets, warm fluids, ambient air, you name it, anything you can do to jack the temperature up. If you are not actively perspiring while you're taking care of a burn patient, your burn patient isn't warm enough. I can almost guarantee that. So we need to keep them warm and dry. The thing I really tell people about these larger burns, you are certainly not in the field and honestly not in the emergency department to do wound care. Wound care comes later, um, actually in a burn unit. It's not their priority right now. Their priority is stabilization. So we need to look at them like we do a trauma patient. Burns are very, very visual, so it makes us want to, that's your problem, this is what I need to do, I need to do wound care. We don't, you don't need to see the wounds yet. You need to stabilize, so keep them uh, covered and that helps with that. Talk about all your smaller burns. Somebody that has a burn on their forearm, not going to get hypothermic. We're not that worried about it. But the actual stopping of the burning process, be it a big burn or a small burn, recommendation is about five minutes. And that's just using water. So by the time they get to the emergency department, the burning process is stopped, meaning we shouldn't be using any wet soaks, wet dressings, anything like that. Ice is always and completely contraindicated in ever putting on an ice. So if they walk into the emergency department with a bag of ice on it, triage is take the bag of ice off. That causes vasoconstriction, that's decreased blood flow to already damaged skin. If you allow them to sit in the waiting area with a bag of ice on it, you can actually be making that burn worse. You could be making it deeper by no blood flow. Recognize when you take the ice off, their pain's going to spike because it'll throb and it'll burn at that particular point. So now let's talk about airway. We really look at airways for two reasons in a burn patient. So the first one is going to be that inhalation injury, and that's usually the really critical um, one. More often, it's uh, taken care of in, in the field. The next one's edema. We'll talk about both of those. So let's talk about the inhalation injury. There's actually three distinguishable types of an inhalation injury. When we say somebody has one, that's all we say. They have an inhalation injury, but there are three types and mechanism of injury can sometimes dictate which one you need to be worried about that person having. So the first one is that upper airway. That's heat right in your face. That's heat and smoke. Somebody catches on fire in the parking lot, runs around, their coat's on fire, they're breathing it right in their mouth. They run around for a very long period of time. Somebody tackles them down. Upper airway is what you would be concerned about, never carbon monoxide or anything. What we're looking for there is a hoarse, raspy voice, maybe strider, uh, erythema in the airway. So that's upper airway. If you catch on fire in this room or at a house or something like that, now you can you certainly can have upper airway, but now let's add deadly carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide has a half-life of four hours on room air, a half-life of about 45 minutes on 100% O2. Uh, put everybody on 100% O2. You're already taking care of the problem. And lastly, you're going to be the inhalation of the chemicals and irritants. Nothing you can do about that. That is just the result of whatever products are burning. Um, exposure time needs to be uh, something that we look at as well. Did they catch on fire and you tackled them? Did they throw gas on a fire and it flashed in their uh, face? That's intense heat, short amount of time. They were sitting in the front lawn outside of a, a house fire waiting for you to get there, or you find out that they were rescued. That's time of contact, and that's going to affect it. So I created this puzzle, and the reason I put this puzzle together is I think it's quick and I think it's easy. Um, there's certainly, you know, many more elements to go into that, but when we're talking at the front end, here are the key pieces of information that you need. There's four pieces to the puzzle. The more positive pieces to the puzzle they have, the higher your index of suspicion is that maybe they have an inhalation injury. You are not diagnosing it. That's coming later with a bronchoscopy. This is index of suspicion. So here are your four pieces. 
We just talked about this location of fire. It's very important to know where the inside or outside. If they're outside, the only thing you would be worried about is potentially upper airway. If it's a car fire coming in, now you're very worried about upper airway and carbon monoxide. Location and then time of exposure should be, um, this is information you need to gain from the providers dropping them off. Next is gonna be physical assessment. This one's a little difficult for people. And the reason being is we are clearly taught that you have a facial burn, uh, singed nasal hair, everything going on. Hence you have an inhalation injury. Um, it's just one piece of the puzzle. You can certainly burn your face and not have an inhalation injury. Conversely, you can have an inhalation injury and not have a thermal burn on you. So it's just one piece of the puzzle. It's something to look at. If potentially they have a facial burn, you're going to be looking more at that upper airway. Next, we're going to go to respiratory assessment. Um, you know what you're looking for here, again, is you're looking for upper airway. You want to talk to someone. You want to listen to their voice. That's listening for that hoarse raspy. Remember, this edema doesn't happen. Boom, you're going to have it. It evolves if they have an upper airway issue. So they may be breathing, talking fine. And then they start getting a little hoarse, maybe start coughing. That may warrant, let's just take a look down in that airway, see if you have, uh, see some of that erythema. So that's your respiratory assessment. And now we move to net mental status. Uh, let me just talk really quickly about mental status as it relates to all burn patients. So we're going to talk about a scald burn and mental status. So let's say that um, mom comes running in the emergency department. She's holding a limp two-year-old, burns from the waist down. She said the kid just fell in the tub. Well, le lethargic, that's a problem right there. Your burns can't change your mental status. Something else has to change that. So covering the burn allows you to find out why there's an altered mental status on a two-year-old with a burn. Damage to your skin doesn't alter your mental status. A 100% burn, head to toe, can walk out of a house fire. The damage to your skin doesn't affect your mental status. Physiologically, it will as we shift our fluid later, but not on the front end, and that's what we're talking about on the front end. So on the front end, when you're talking about an inhalation injury with um, mental status, you're going to lean towards carbon monoxide, you know, unless they jumped out of a three-story window. So if we're leaning towards carbon monoxide, the way we treat that, high flow O2. So let's put it into practice. So you have a nine-year-old female standing around on a uh, trash barrel and somebody throws gas on it. Wonderful. That's all you know right now. So let's put the puzzle in her head because she interacted with flame or smoke in some way. So let's do index of suspicion. So was she an inside or outside fire? Where was she? Outside fire. So if you're worried about anything, what part of the airway might you be worried about? Upper airway, great. So next is physical assessment. Does she have a facial burn? Yes, she does. It's a pretty severe facial burn. Pretty much singed everything. everything. So that's all you know right now. She's outside and has a facial burn. So we're gonna move to respiratory assessment. How are you gonna assess that? Talk to her. You're worried about upper airway. So we want to hear her voice. We want to hear, is she hoarse, raspy, anything going like that? How do you assess mental status? You're talking to her. She's answering your question. So if you were worried about her uh, airway, she would be a high, a moderate, or low. She's going to be in the really low category. I'm not worried about her airway. She was in intense heat short amount of time. She simply, somebody threw gas on something and it flashed in her face. We protect our airways very, very well. Here we have a 14 year old male, sprays accelerant around on his clothing and runs around the house. So again, this is all you know. So we're gonna go to location of fire. Is he inside or outside? He's inside. Another good question is how long did he run around the house? How long was he on fire? Was he in the basement and running all over or did he run in his bedroom and get in the shower? That's exposure time. Next one is uh, physical assessment. Does he have a facial burn? Yeah, he does. Do you see any soot around his nose, mouth? You can actually see it in his braces a little bit right there. So now we have somebody in an enclosed space and we have a facial burn and we see some soot with that. How are you going to assess your respiratory status? Got ahead of myself. Respiratory status, 
talking to him. Let's say he's just actively coughing. Uh, he's not really that hoarse, maybe a little bit, whatever. Don't need to be aggressive at this point, but I'm probably going to put him on a non-rebreather mask, right? He's the one that or, uh, warrants a little bit of oxygen. And you assessed his mental status by talking to him. If you were worried about an airway, would you be high, moderate, or low? How worried would you be? Moderate. Yeah, you put him on oxygen. He's the one you worry about. So what this puzzle does for you is just gives you a different way, honestly, to think about facial burns more than anything, but to think about somebody you're worried about an inhalation injury. Your face does not equal airway injury. Now let's talk about uh, burn shock and edema. So uh, who goes into burn shock? We do not consider burn patients going into actual burn shock into a 20% total body surface area or greater. Um, when you get a 20% um, burn or greater, you're going to have systemic edema. Um, anybody under that is going to have localized edema. Hence, somebody that has a burn face and it's just their face, just their face will swell. Doesn't mean their airway swelling. That's not systemic edema. If you have a 50% total body surface area and their face is swelling, that's systemic edema. You're going to be worried about airway at that point. How much edema do they have? Um, it's proportional certainly to the size of the burn. The bigger your burn, obviously, the more fluid you're going to shift. Um, it's also proportional to the size of the person. So if it's a six-month-old and they're a 40% scald, they probably are going to be intubated, honestly. Uh, edema starts within the first few hours of the injury. They say maximum is at 24. I honestly think it's more like 48. And then hopefully they'll diurese and you can extubate them. If you are a, a you know, a 15 year old and have a 40% burn, maybe not. Your airway is so much larger. Think of that airway resistance from that edema. So here's a guy that just has a face and a little bit of his arm burn. That's all that's burned on him. You can certainly see he has a lot of facial edema. You know, it's dependent edema. It's the inflammatory response. Elevate his head. It'll go away in a couple of days. It's not affecting his airway, as opposed to a 60% burn. On a 60% burn, on an 18-month-old, they're going to have a massive fluid shift starting within the first few hours, and then it's going to continue. So you don't want to be in the middle of transport or something when this edema starts evolving. So these are going to be your bigger burns. Remember, the bigger the burn, the more edema they're going to have. You know, somebody uh, that has this type of burn is probably more often than not from some type of structure fire, honestly, probably would have been intubated at the scene. Um, if they weren't, it's a rapid intubation. But really just look at their tongue, their lips, just everything going on with that. So that's just that evolution of edema and where these kids move through. Escherotomies, it's a surgical procedure. Um, the reason I bring it up here, here's the biggest thing to know about Escar. I've already shown several pictures of it. Escar is a dry, leathery, um, it's brown, it's tan, it's all of those colors. It's not soft, you know, red, any of that, no blisters. It is epidermis down to dermis. It's going to be a full thickness injury. Your skin immediately loses its elasticity if you have escar. So why I bring escarotomies up now, we'll talk about it for vascular purposes later, is because if you have a full torso of escar, you immediately lose that chest expansion right? Because not only do you lose the expansion, you're, off, you're also shifting fluid. So you're attempting to swell on top of it. So add that to your diaphragm and you're not able to have chest expansion. This is a chest escherotomy for ventilatory purposes. Um, these come with circumferential. That's why it's always important to know if anything is circumferential, right? All the way around. Because what you're either going to lose is blood flow or you're going to use lose chest expansion. And again, these are on your very, very large burns that you typically do a chest escherotomy. A lot of different ways to do it. As we move through this, you'll see different photos of different techniques. There's not one way that is really just the accepted way uh, to relieve the uh, chest. So body surface area, how big of a burn are you dealing with? 
Um, so this is where we get into total body surface area. I will tell you that studies have clearly shown um, that there is about a 20% variant between um, a burn unit and where it comes from outlying. And one of the reasons that that comes is just you don't see them very often. This is what burn units use. Um, this is the acceptable tool and it's called the Lund Browder. Uh, the intent of that is to draw exactly what you see and then uh, it goes into very specific body and very specific ages. This is the one that will give you the most accurate total body surface area. Um, the other thing I want you to just kind of look at, and I'll talk about this in a second. If you see on this burn diagram, it says initial total body surface area. I'll, I'll tell you why we have initial right there um, as we move on. This is what most people know, and this is what most people are taught, and this is going to be rule of nines. Uh, just the problem with rule of nines is overestimation. It's just really hard to look at these percents and get them down. Uh, very rarely are burns like circumferential from the top of your arm to your fingers, completely everything covered. Well, that's a 9%. It's usually splattered here, 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 and there. It's hard to get nine down to two. Um, so it's just overestimation. And in pediatrics, you can see as you get to five and under, um, they're not nines anymore. They kind of morph away. The other thing is if mom pours a pot of boiling water on a six month old head, they're already almost a 20% burn. You know, if she falls and pours it on her head, she's only a 9% burn. So body surface area plays into that as well. So uh, Lund Browder rule of nines, knowing that um, almost 70% of burns are under 10%, um, I'm going to give you a tool to use. So let's uh, look at this guy right here. So uh, we're going to use rule of nines on him. So going with rule of nines, Somebody just give me a wild guess of your total body surface area. He's a, this is a 14 year old. Jump it out there. We're not grading it. And there's another thing about rule of nines is as you're trying to keep somebody warm and dry, warm and dry, you're doing math. 36. He's a 7% total body surface area. That's his burn diagram. Pretty crazy, right? And that's where rule of nines get you. And, and it's okay. It, it, it's very, very common. It's not like, oh my God, I can't believe they did that. It's, that's the way rule of nines works. It's just difficult. Another great tool to use on him um, any small scattered burns, this tool is amazing and it's incredibly accurate. Remember, most burns are small. It's the patient's entire hand, that's including fingers, and it's a closed hand like this, right, uh, is 1% of their total body surface area. Three-month-old, it's their hand, and 80-year-old, it's their hand. Everybody in this room, your hand is 1% of you. That's total body surface area. What this allows you to do is look quickly at a burn and be pretty much spot on. So I'm gonna show you a nine-year-old female Think of a nine-year-old female and her her hand, and tell, oh, here she is. Oh, I changed her. I lied to you. This is a two-year-old. This is a two-year-old. Use a total or a Palmer method for a two-year-old. Two percent. Twelve-year-old female. Use your hand. Use her hand to her body. Five percent. Wow. Now, number one, see how much quicker that was than trying to get rule of nines? We would have still been thinking about it because it's hard to just get 18 and, oh, is that? Honestly, if you used rule of nines, she would have been a 10 or greater. It's just the way that tool works. Um, so again, for small scattered, Palmer method is great. Be cautious with the uh, rule of nines just because of that overestimation. If you have the availability of the Lund Browder, that's the way to go because that's going to be spot on. That uh, Palmer method tool is used for small burns. Big old house fire comes in. You're not going to use the Palmer method. You will move definitely to a different tool for this kind of a burn.
This is why you're calculating total body surface area. You're calculating it for two reasons. The first reason is to see if you need to give fluid because we resuscitate 20% and greater. And if you are gonna give fluid, how much fluid to give. So that's why you are calculating total body surface area. Anybody 20%, we resuscitate. Um, if you're choosing to put an IV and an 8% burn, um, it's just either to give them pain medicine or for some other reason other than resuscitation. Anybody under two and over 65, they always recommend starting fluid on them as well. You wanna go with a large bore IV. When you get to about 40% and greater, it's always great to have two large bore IVs if you can. Uh, you can put an IV in pink, red, cherry red. Um, you know, preferences you not, but if it's 100% scald, you know, it's what you're gonna go for. Um, if they are 100% eschar, you're not gonna get a peripheral IV in. You can't hit through leather. Um, hopefully they would come into you with an IO and then they'll probably transition to a, a central line at that point. Lactated ringers is just preferred. Uh, most people are gonna use normal saline. Uh, eventually they should be switched over um, and obviously beginning as soon as possible. When we look at these formulas, they're all 24 hour formulas. That's why beginning soon as possible is important. So the first two are the ones that are recommended by the American Burn Association. They are evidence-based and that's pre-hospital. Uh, the bottom three uh, are just, or bottom four are the most common that are used in-house or in a hospital setting. So here are the ones we'll look at. Uh, disaster fluid management, that's what the American Burn Association calls it. The military calls it rule of 10. Um, this is what they use. Closest 10% times 10, that's all there is to this formula. So you think they're a 50% burn, 50 times 10 is 500. That's, that's what you're gonna resuscitate them out. Um, it is what is recommended for a mass, uh, mass casualty um, scenario, but it is intended for adults. So if a school bus catches on fire and it's a bunch of five-year-olds, um, that tool is not really intended for them. Um, it is for adults. Uh, this is what is recommended by the American Burn Association. If you take the Advanced Burn Life Support course, this is what is going to be taught. It is evidence-based, and this is what we try to get uh, pre-hospital exclusively to use. It's hard. Um, it's been slow. I know some places that are switching to it, but it's very difficult. Um, why shouldn't they be using some of the other total body surface area uh, formulas? Because they will never be accurate in a total body surface area. They are not in a controlled setting. It can be dark. It can be smoky. It can be a min million things. They may think they have a 60% burn and it's 10 because it's soot and smoke. So they will never be accurate with total body surface area. So what this allows them to do is begin as soon as possible, which is crucial, and not over or under resuscitate. It's based on how old they are. That's all there is to it. It's a 15-year-old, run them at 500. It's a two-year-old, run them at 120, 125. I don't care about the size of your burn, nor do I even need to know how much you weigh. Here are the... Uh, total body surface area. Sorry about that. Here are the total body surface area. All of them are milliliter times weight in kilos times percent burn. The Parkland formula is four milliliters. The modified Brook is two. The consensus, which came out of the American Burn Association, is two, three, or four. Whatever you want to use, it's a consensus. Um, and the pediatric is three. So those are all of those different formulas. A lot of people think they're using the Parkland. Most people have moved away from it because of over resuscitation. So here's how the formula works. Three milliliters times weight in kilos times percent burn. 20 kilo kid, 90% burn. This little one should get 5,400 milliliters in the first eight hours, half of that amount in the, uh, half, in the first 24, half of that amount in the first eight. So we're gonna divide that, and then we need to divide it again to get how many milliliters per hour. So this child should be running at 338 milliliters an hour. So let's say that they came in from the field and they were running at 250 because they're using the initial. This formula says they need to be at 338. You bump them up to 338. 
what they missed in that interim is okay. You're not going to catch up on that. You want to start them at 338. The way we get from 338 down to that 169 is we're going to do that by urine. You see the D5LR uh, that's underneath each one of those. Uh, this is a change actually uh, through the uh, advanced burn life support course. They define pediatrics as 12 and under. Anybody 12 and under because of their um, glycogen stores should have D5LR added to them. I just use the 421 rule for that. So that's why they're running at 60. So anybody 12 and under, they need to have D5LR on top of that 338. So anyway, you got them at 338. How are we gonna get down to 169? You have to measure urine, only way to do it. Uh, all of your other vital signs may not be accurate. Um, if they are a very large burn, I can tell you getting a blood pressure through escar and edema is not going to be very accurate. So that kind of takes that away. Uh, almost all of them are tachycardic, typically 120 or greater. So that's not a very good indication of fluid. That's why we measure urine. So if you've chosen to put an IV in for pain medicine, don't worry about it. If you're resuscitating, they're at 25% burn, you need a Foley catheter. You have to put, you have to measure it. So our adults should give us 30 to 50. Our kids should get a, give us about one milliliter per kilo per hour. So how do we decide what our fluids are going to do? Uh, at 338, the formula I showed you, it's a formula. It's not a prescription. What do I mean by that? I mean, it just told you where it thought it should start based on those numbers. It's not saying, boy, you have to run at 338 and eight hours later, drop to 169. That's why you're measuring urine. So let's say in the first um, hour, 20 kilo kid gave you three of urine. You're not resuscitating adequately. You're not perfusing kidneys or skin. You must do something. We wanna increase fluids by a third. Let's say in the next half an hour, you've got no urine, increased fluids by a third. We ask that you try to stay away from boluses. Um, the only time I would recommend a bolus is if they have a critical blood pressure. If they're hypotensive and you wanna throw a bolus on there, that's great, but you're gonna have to do something else because all the fluid you keep pouring in there rapidly, they're third spacing, right? They're shifting it out. So if you continue to bolus, 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 it's all you're doing is increasing their edema because it shifts away. You have to do something with that 338. And that means just keep increasing it until you get the results you want. So again, 338 to 169, 20 kilo kid gave you a hundred of urine. Too much, start backing down. Hopefully in that eight hours, you will back down enough to get to one, or around 169. I'm telling you, your fluids will do this the whole time. Never are you just like that. That's just resuscitation. That's why urine is so important. So now let's uh, look at the different uh, types of injuries and mechanisms of injuries. So these are going to be your contact burns. Um, they are usually uh, your smaller injuries. Um, you can usually see the pattern of what happened. Two-year-old in a diaper in the winter fell into a kerosene heater. I can look at that pattern and be like, that's pretty daggone consistent. Remember, we're dealing with pediatrics. These are considered traumas. We just need to make sure that stories match what we're seeing. This is grabbing a curling iron or a flat iron. You've heard me say the American Burn Association many times. Uh, so the American Heart Association, they do everything for the heart, right? If CPR changes, anything like that. The American Burn Association, they set up all of protocols for the burn world. The problem with the American Burn Association is we're not very good at communicating outside of our world. Um, if the American Heart Association changes something, everybody knows it, right? You need to redo CPR, stop the bleed, whatever it is. Um, when ABA uh, changes something, they let everybody in the burn world know, but essentially not outside of that. Um, so some of these protocols you may not have heard before. So here is a referral criteria. Any burn, regardless of size, face, hands, feet, genitalia, crossing a joint. 
That's a referable injury that you see there. It's not based on the size. The other criteria is any burn 10% or above and anything full six full thickness regardless of size. Those are referable injuries. Doesn't need to come in the middle of the night. It's an outpatient referral, but it's certainly a referral and that's for specialized OT, PT and wound care. This is falling into a fire pit. You know, this would be a middle of the night referral. So again, kind of depending on the type of injury. When you look at your scald burns, all burns are gonna be based on temperature and time of contact. Um, obviously, the hotter it is, the quicker you burn, the longer you're in it, the deeper your burn. Uh, safe bath water is 104 or less. Uh, water, your recommendation for your water heaters, 120. Takes about five minutes to get a burn in 120 degree water. Water comes out of a coffee pot at 150 to 180. So if you get your cup of coffee and you spill it in your lap or your kid pulls it down on themselves, that's what we call an instantaneous burns. Kids two and under burn twice as quickly. So if it's a one-year-old in 120 degree water, it takes less than two minutes for them to burn. So here are your water scalds. Uh, pink, red, cherry, red, blisters intact. Escar, which I've shown you multiple times, will not never be present on the front end of a scald. They demarcate differently. They heal differently. Uh, so the anticipation is any scald burn you see should be pink, red, cherry, red, blisters intact. If they show up and have a thick, cheesy eschar um, on there, I'm going to think about delay in treatment. So it's just the different way scalds look. So again, pink, red, cherry, red, blisters intact. Those are going to be your scald burns. So think about to the burn diagram when I showed you that initial uh, burn diagram. And the reason that we have initial is because when you see a burn immediately after it happens, you are truly guessing on what depth you think it is. Um, unless it's eschar. If it's eschar, we can all go, that's full thickness. Anything that is of a different color is what we call indeterminate. So, well, how do you know the depth of the wound? Wound care is based on time of healing. So if a burn heals in about 14 days, you should not have a scar. Uh, maybe a little bit of pigmenta pigmentation change, uh, but honestly doubtful. If you take uh, two weeks to about three weeks to heal a burn, um, it can leave a mark. We genetically scar differently, so it's just gonna be dependent. If you haven't healed a burn in about three weeks, we're gonna talk about going to surgery at that particular time. So the way we do this is we follow in our outpatient department. We'll see them on day one or two. And then we usually don't see them back for seven to 10 days because it really just doesn't matter what your burn looks like on day two and three. It's kind of seven, 10, 14, 21. So you can see this young lady here, she shows up on post-op day one. Obviously we're gonna debride all that off. We're gonna have a very bright red wound right there. We're gonna guess it's partial thickness. She comes back in seven days and it's like, she was partial thickness. There goes our final burn diagram. We do an initial and we do a final because sometimes you thought it was partial and it's actually full. That's why we have two burn diagrams. Here's your classic dip burns. Um, some of the things with these are um, the straight lines, the no splash marks, and the inconsistent story. Um, so I put this uh, baby in the tub, I left the bathroom, and I heard the water running, ran in, the baby screaming, and pull them out, and their skin's falling off. It's an inconsistent story, because you can see from that pattern of injury, the water was all the same temperature. Um, you can't just turn water on in tepid water and it get hot like that. Um, not saying it's abusive, I'm just saying it's a questionable story it will be something that we look at. The clear demarcation, that's gonna be straight lines. Uh, baby in a little tub, she said he hit the water faucet and it, it came on um, in the sink. It just didn't happen that way and you can see that the tub was full. Um, you can see the depth of the water and you can see they lowered the baby and the hands went back. Not saying it's abusive, again, just saying it didn't happen that way you said. Sparing of flexion creases, Sometimes the little rear end, sometimes the bottom of the feet. Uh, that's somebody holding you on the surface of the tub, not allowing water to get to the flexion crease. Um, you can't fall in a bathtub and have that pattern of injury. It just doesn't work that way. So those are some of the things that we actually look for.
Your flash and flame burns, uh, this is when you want to put the puzzle together, uh, anything involving flash or flame. These are your flame burns. Again, intense heat, short amount of time. Escar, escar. Everybody knows what that is now. That can be present um, at scene and when they get to the emergency department with a flame burn, different from a scald burn. So that's escar. Everything that's surrounding that is called indeterminate. We're going to give that time of healing. Your chemical burns, uh, that five minutes I said before, you want to do 20 minutes continuously. Make sure the water is going away from them. Tap water is always what you want to use. No salines or anything like that because you don't know what it's going to react. Uh, brush powder before you flush. You don't want to cause a reaction. These are just some of the different products that these things are in. Uh, they burn differently. Alkalis actually combine with your lipids and melt you. The longer it's on you, the deeper it can go. Where an acid causes coagulation necrosis, it's a tanning of the skin. It can be full thickness. They look differently. That's an alkali burn. Um, so on your left is day two. On the right is 22 days later. That is a full thickness alkali burn. That is an acid burn. You can see that coagulation necrosis. Both of those are full thickness. They look differently. Your electrical burns, you have low voltage, high voltage. Uh, the biggest thing about low voltage, um, you're not conducting electricity. Um, it is localized to whatever you bite into or are holding on to when you stick it in the outlet. It is localized to that contact point as opposed to high voltage, where now it's flowing through you following path of least resistance. Here's some considerations with your large electricals. Um, they do recommend that they are on a cardiac monitor. They do recommend that you get an EKG. Um, they typically have, if they have a very big electrical, they will have hemoglobin in their urine. Um, and that's indicative of muscle death. And then they almost always get a compartment syndrome and require fasciotomies. And then lastly, we resuscitate them higher because their total body surface area isn't accurate because a lot of that burn is internal as opposed to what you actually see. So those are just some special considerations with your high voltage electrical. So here are your low voltage. Um, so again, that's a plug in a cord and it's frayed. So it popped her right there. And that's using your mouth to pull apart a plug in an extension cord. Um, so it's going to snap them right there. Um, you can certainly see on the right that that is Escar and he will lose all of that tissue. As opposed to your high voltage injuries, um, this is where it's going to flow through you, right? So you grab, uh, you're holding a pole and lift up a high tension wire. So now it's going wire, pull boom, through you, wherever you're grounded, which is typically going to be your feet, it's going to flow, and that's usually where it exits. It exits many other spots, not just A to B, uh, so we have to look for a lot of contact points, um, but that's usually where it's going to uh, flow through. Uh, he definitely had a compartment syndrome. Those are fasciotomies that you see there, and then, of course, that's where he is standing on the ground, um, and that's all of that loss of tissue. So those are gonna be your high uh, voltage injuries. And then that's what's most common uh, with your high voltage injuries. The thing again, that is wonderful about the shrine is um, because we have orthopedic units, uh, this child, was he Guatemala? Do you remember? I, Guatemala, I'm not sure. He was an international patient. We can't really send him back there with no arms or legs. So he went actually to our Houston hospital and they made him all prosthetics. Um, and then he follows up with them as he grows to continue to get his prosthetics. So here's some other things that are treated in a burn unit. Uh, frostbite, biggest thing to know about it is don't ever rub it. Um, don't pour, put hot packs or anything like that on it. You can cause damage. Um, if it's the third level, they can actually have crystals under their skin. You can cause, again, damage. We flow them through water at about 104 degrees, and you thaw them out. Uh, this is a friction burn. That's actually sticking your fingers in a vacuum cleaner. Uh, treadmills are the most common. And then road rash is treated like any partial thickness injury, which we'll go over in just a second. And then these are also treated in a burn unit. Um, these aren't 
to be in medical ICUs or anything like that. The top left is erythema multiforma. The bottom one is Stevens-Johnson syndrome. And the top right is toxic epidermal necrolysis. So here's your different degrees, uh, superficial, dry and pink. Here's what's difficult about a superficial on the very front end of that. Um, you're not supposed to calculate superficial in your total body surface area because you're not losing fluid from it. If you remember, I said that a burn hasn't completely demarcated when you see it right after a burn. So, I mean, how many people have had a sunburn and you go to sleep and you wake up the next day and, oh, you've got blisters. You just, now you have a partial thickness. So that's what's hard about these superficials when you initially see them. So this is another reason why the total body surface area is sometimes a little bit more than is actual because it's just difficult with front end superficial. Here are your partial thickness injuries, uh, blisters. Essentially, you have a partial thickness. It's your epidermis, part of your dermis. How much of your dermis is burned depends on time of healing. Um, if you know it's very superficial, seven days. If a little more of your dermis, 14 days. Quite a bit of your dermis, 21 days. That kind of goes with the depth of the injury. Uh, to keep blisters or not, we debride all blisters. Um, the way we do it is a washcloth, soap, and water. Um, we're going to soap it up really good and give it a nice firm swipe. And then we're going to take a clean washcloth, clean water, and give it a nice firm swipe. So it's a wash, it's a rinse, and it's good to go. If you are referring a patient from your emergency department to us, we ask that you not do wound care. We will do wound care ourselves. We ask, and I'll show you the topical in just a second. We just ask that you put the topical on it. We'll do the wound care. It's fine for the maybe 24 hours until it gets to us, whatever it's gonna be. Uh, so if you're gonna follow it yourself, that's washing, rinsing, topical. Referring to Shriners, leave it alone and we will take care of it. Um, there are a ton of different products out there for outpatient treatment of burns. Uh, this is the basic one. Um, this is kind of the tied and true, and that's going to be any antibiotic ointment. Um, there's a ton of silver products, not silvadine, silver products that are used. Um, they really should be only used in a burn unit because a lot of education goes into actually using them. Um, so any kind of antibiotic ointment. So again, you're referring to Shriners, big old blister, maybe cut a little portion out so it does uh, drain and then take some um, antibiotic ointment, put it on a non-adherent dressing, roll it around in your hands. You're impregnating that dressing, slap it on there, wrap it up and make the referral. That's wound care. Um, and then we'll either transition them to a silver dressing or whatever's appropriate for them. Silvadine, if you leave here from your residency and go somewhere else and they're still using Silvadine in the emergency department, uh, they haven't really had updated education for a while. It's not really recognized as appropriate outpatient treatment for burns. Time of healing, day two. You guys, who knows? I'm guessing partial, but that white area on his chest is a little concerning right there. And 14 days later, it comes back and you're like, huh, look at that, I was right. That's how it goes. Your full thickness injuries, uh, most of them are gonna show up like the top picture, the bottom picture, everybody in here now knows that's eschar. That's gonna require surgical intervention. Escarotomies for vascular impairment. Remember, if you have circumferential eschar to your chest, it's gonna affect your breathing. If you have it to an extremity, it's going to affect your circulation. You do not have to be a large burn to have a circulation issue. It just needs to be circumferential. Pulses are absolutely critical if you have a circumferential injury, regardless of the size, you, because they're gonna have localized edema, maybe not systemic. So the top is an escherotomy done on both sides of the extremity, crosses all joints. The bottom is a fasciotomy. That's to relieve that compartment, to allow them through that time of swelling. Those hopefully will approximate We'll excise and then graft over them. Oh, sorry. My bad. That wasn't an escherotomy. That's an escherotomy. That's a fasciotomy. So here's the one I say that you're going to see most often. See it? We're like, huh, that's superficial. They come back 10 days later and you're like, 
oh goodness. And then they come back 20 days later and you're like, well, that's a full thickness injury. You can see on day one, it's very difficult to look at a burn and be 100% accurate unless it's SCAR. That's why we have to follow that time of healing. That's grafting. That's a donor site. It's where we uh, shave the skin off. And that is a sheet autographed. Uh, we prefer sheet. They're more cosmetic, more durable, and contract less as opposed to a lot of mesh grafting. Um, so that's actual wound uh, closure. So we'll go through and just kind of see what you were able to capture from this really fast presentation uh, that you just set through. Um, I do it fast for two reasons, keep most people awake, I hope, and to get a lot of information in a short amount of time. Um, so here we have a 12-year-old male. There was an aerosol can in a trash fire. Uh, when first responders get there, he's awake, alert, sitting in the backyard. This is all you know that you're getting. So it's involving flash and flame. So let's put our puzzle together. So uh, inside, outside, an outside fire. Does he have a facial burn? Not impressive, but he does. Do you see any soot around his nose, mouth, anything like that? How are you going to assess his respiratory status? He's talking normally. He's not in any distress. I personally would not choose to put any oxygen on him. Air to nerve endings hurts. So blowing on it's going to be a problem. I would just leave him alone. How did you assess his mental status? You're talking to him. Are you very worried, kind of worried, or not worried at all? I'm not worried about his airway, right? This is an intense heat, short amount of time. It's a young man with a facial burn. What's a really quick, easy way to calculate his total body surface area? What percent is his hand to his body? What percent burn is he? There you Here's the key. What percent burns are we worried about? 20. Is he close to 20? So it didn't really matter if you said 10, 9, 5, did it? He's not 20. That's kind of my point with that. When you get to 20, now we need to be accurate because that drives some interventions. Under that, ballpark it. So no, we know that already. He does not require fluid resuscitation. What's just that initial dressing? Just a dry dressing until you're ready to do wound care. Uh, you don't want to leave most of it open to air because it just kind of drives your pain. And then pain control for him. There you go, ibuprofen. Um, in Tennessee, uh, first responders now give ketamine. And I did this at a big EMS conference. And in mass, everybody said ketamine. And I was like, well, that is aggressive. Um, <laughs> but I guess if you can give ketamine in the field, go for it. Everybody said it. They give it like candy down there. A uh, 15-year-old involved in a house fire in January. When crews get there, um, he's laying in the front yard. They're spraying him with a hose. Uh, looks like everything's burned off but his uh, underwear. And he does appear to be covered all in escar. So right now, this is all you know. Patient is obtunded. What kind of airway management? Aggressive, right. Intubation, if that's what they were able to do. Uh, bagging, if they don't intubate in the field and you're going to be aggressive. Um, because he has an altered mental status and he just walked out of a house and was laying there, I'm not worried about, you know, a head injury. What do we think is altering his mental status? Carbon monoxide. How do we treat it? High flow O2, right? So you want him on 100% for sure. Uh, this one's kind of a no-brainer, um, but he was hypothermic when he was in the field and when he got to you. The one thing that is not his priority, wound care. Wound care is not his priority. To look at his wounds, to assess his wounds, you're going to do one extremity at a time. You're not going to have him all open for everybody to be attacking him. Maintaining his temperature is more critical than soap and water at this point. So we want to check one leg, see if it's circumferential, and then give us access for pulses. Wrap the leg up, but you want somewhere where they don't have to uncover him every time they need to check pulses. This stuff is really, really critical. It's not really intuitive um, because you really just think, you know, if somebody's actively bleeding, you don't cover it up and do something else, right? You stop the bleeding. 
It's just not that way with a burn. Um, it's just the damage is there. You guys can't make it any better or any worse at that particular moment. So again, anything you can do for him. Due to extensive eschar, are you going to get IV access? What, what do you think he's going to have? And hopefully he should come from the field with an IO if they're able to for sure. Does anybody remember initial? This is pre-hospital initial. 500, 500, anybody 13 and above, we're gonna run them at five. So he comes at you, hopefully running at 500. What's preferred? Yeah, if you can do it, that's great. Um, and then he's transported. Now he's at you. So when he gets to you, you guys think he's about a 90 to 100%. He's got two IOs at 100, but look at his temperature. Therein lies his problem. So that's where I'm saying wound care doesn't matter because if we can't resuscitate him and you very difficult to resuscitate cold burn patients, it really increases their fluid needs. So again, all of those things, we're going to resuscitate him using modified Brook. Two milliliters, 60 kilos, 90% burn. He should be running at 675. You need to have obviously a urinary catheter in there and we want him to be between about 30 to 50 because he is over that 12 year old. So here's what he looks like. Remember, they look like this at scene. He's African-American. What's not burned is between his shoulder blades, a little on his hip right there. That's just his chest escherotomy. So here he is uh, six hours later, got him up to 96.5. With this particular gentleman here, he got to us pretty rapidly. He was uh, 12 hours, he came from West Virginia. He was 12 hours into it uh, when we got him. And we didn't do his dressing for 24 in the burn unit. We did not do his dressing. Um, we checked his compartments. He did get all the escherotomies, but other than that, we just left him. Um, again, it wouldn't have changed his outcome, but hypothermia can. He only has 10 of urine out, not enough. What do you want to do with fluid? There you go. Continue to do that. Maybe check your urine every 30 minutes now. Don't wait a full hour. Um, I know that this is, um, you know, not meant to be offensive in any way. Make sure the equipment's working. We have had many times where the Foley's kinked and they keep getting them up and up and up. And then all of a sudden it moves and it's like, oh, wow. I guess it was working, so just check that as well. That's happened multiple times. So he's at 700 now. The only reason I show you this, he's already going to surgery. An autograft is your own skin. Allograft is cadaver skin. It's a temporary wound coverage. This is his autografting. Allograft, it's cadaver skin. Um, hopefully your body will accept that for about two weeks, fingers crossed, and then your body will reject it. Um, once you reject it, hopefully your donor sites are ready for us to reharvest because that's where we're getting that skin. It's four months out. Six months out and then three years out. Does anybody have any questions for me? Wait a second. Thanks, Anna. What are you guys doing for pain control when you're doing the wound care? So debriding all the um, blisters. So, and so does, uh, for pain control, it's really dependent on uh, more of the size of the burn. So most often for those initial, if you're being admitted, your initial, uh, you're going to get ketamine because we're going to really scrub you on that initial. And then depending, uh, either you're either going to get, um, if you have an IV, pushes of morphine. Um, we're not fentanyl users. We're more morphine um, because of the um, buildup of that. And if not, you're just going to get some kind of opioid. Uh, if you're in-house and you are a large burn, you're going to be on a morphine versed, sometimes Presidex, and you'll be on methadone. What is, uh, <clears throat> what's quality of life like for these 
large burns like that or, or complications, you know, thereafter. The yeah. Range. So uh, that's, that's honestly a really good question. Cause a lot of people don't think about that. Um, they move from burn victims and then they're called burn survivors. Um, and for kids, it's a little tougher because they're growing and scars contract. Uh, so there's a lot of reconstruction that goes on um, once you sustain a burn injury. And that's why being with a burn unit is helpful because we help them as they grow. A um, little more difficult sometimes for adults uh, to find that type of aftercare. Um, the other thing that people just do not think about is if you are a big 80% burn and you were grafted, you were all full thickness, no oil glands, sweat glands, um, or hair follicles and elasticity. Uh, so we just had a really wonderful speaker come to our open house um, over at Triners, and he's a, a strong man, um, and he was a 65% total body surface area. And people just don't think about it, but for competitions, he doesn't regulate his heat because he does not have sweat glands. So it's a little tougher for him than for everybody else. So those are some of the challenge. It's dry, itchy, hairless skin essentially. Uh, but most of them, they have so many burn survivor groups that are amazing. Uh, they do really well. Most of them end up becoming motivational speakers, honestly. Okay. Yeah. I have two questions. So, uh, you said earlier that there's these new fluid guidelines, but there's been trouble getting it adopted or accepted. Is the pushback more on the differences in rates and calculating the rates or is the push back more on the selection of like lactated ringers versus normal saline or something like along those lines? Uh, the pushback is uh, most, a lot of the protocols come from the state level and you have people controlling that uh, that aren't burn experts. Uh, they're uh, trauma experts and they use trauma protocols uh, which are different than burn protocols. Um, so that's the challenge that I've found. Um, so it's, it's the rate, it's what's accepted. Um, we just don't resuscitate them like we do all the other, which, you know, sometimes boluses, 20 per kilo, all of that is just different in the burn world. And that's communication, I think, from the burn world, actually. Gotcha. And my second question is with respect to like keloid formation, the people mm -hmm. that scar uh, excessively, do you have to do extra uh, escharotomies or how does that play into burn care? Is it a complication of any kind? So as far as uh, keloiding and hypertrophic scarring, um, you will start laying down your scar sometimes when you're still in the hospital before we can even get the rest of you covered. Um, honestly, not very many people develop keloids. Uh, most of them are hypertrophic. Just quickly, the definition, a hypertrophic stays within the bounds of whatever your injury was, where a keloid does not, and it goes everywhere. Um, you can excise a hypertrophic and graft it and then give proper scar management and maybe different. So we use compression therapy to prevent these things from happening. So the whole thought process is uh, as you actively scar, your collagen's all disordered. We give you a compression garment to wear 23 hours a day uh, for at least a year after your burn injury. And the whole thought is it forces your collagen to lay flat. So then your scars are better. Um, if you are a keloid former, nothing you can do about it. Uh, there's a lot of research. That's one of our biggest researches, research initiatives at Shriners is due to keloids. Any questions from our listeners online? Okay. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you. It's so much information in a, in a little amount of time, but you can no, stretch really this out is. to four hours, but you lose people. Yeah, I actually uh, interviewed for Shriner's position in uh, Galveston. Oh, 